So here we are um, at this story about Jesus as the bread of life, but I thought we would start off, given that it was just Vacation Bible School and given the fact that we have so many uh, wonderful young people in the crowd today, with some children's letters to God. You may have seen some of these before. These are some of my favorites that I picked out. And this one says, Dear God, in Bible times, did they really talk that funny? From Jennifer. These are all actual letters to God written by children. Thank you for the baby brother, but what I prayed for was a puppy. <laughs> Love, Joyce. Dear God, if you watch in church on Sunday, I will show you my new shoes. That's from Mickey. Dear God, if you let the dinosaurs not extinct, we would not have a country. You did the right thing. <laughs> Love, Jonathan. Dear God, if you give me a genie lamp like Aladdin, I will give you anything you want, except my money or my chess set. <laughs> From Raphael. Uh, dear God, please put another holiday between Christmas and Easter. There is nothing good in there now. <laughs> That's from Ginny. Dear God, maybe Cain and Abel would not kill each other so much if they had their own rooms. It works with my brother. <laughs> That's Larry. Thanks, Larry. And I think this one's my favorite. Uh, we read that Thomas Edison made light, but in Sunday school they said, you did it. I bet he stole your idea. <laughs> Sincerely, Donna. Well, children's letter to God, they're wonderful because we know that children have this sense of God. We know that children have the sense of the divine, perhaps even more than adults. But sometimes they don't put together the whole picture exactly correctly. But that's what makes these, uh, you know, so charming and so beautiful. They don't have the full picture, and yet they still have this sense of who God is and what God is about. In our gospel story today, uh, the crowd follows Jesus all the way across the lake, and they start asking him questions, and it's sort of the same situation. They have a sense of who Jesus is, they have a sense of who Jesus is about, but they don't quite have the full picture together. And so Jesus, after he has uh, fed the 5,000 people on the hillside, and that was the story that we heard last week, remember the feeding of the 5,000, the feeding of the multitudes, all of a sudden uh, goes away for some R&R, &R, and the people follow him all the way across the lake. And Jesus just can't seem to get away from these crowds. And they're asking him questions about uh, you know, who he is and, and what this is all about. But it becomes clear to Jesus immediately that they're really asking about bread and wanting more bread and more fish like they had the previous day. Now, you can't blame them. That was a pretty extraordinary experience on the mountainside with uh, Jesus feeding the multitudes. And here the people come back the next day and they said, hey, Jesus, can we get an encore? Can we get a, a second performance of all that feeding? And Jesus has to explain to them that, yes, he's about feeding, but he is also uh, something bigger, something bolder, something more enriching than just uh, feeding of multitudes. So he has this, this narrative. Um, you know, they go in the boats to Capernaum to look for Jesus. They found him. They say, when did you get here? And Jesus knows, I tell you for certain that you're not looking for me because you saw the miracles, but because of all the food that you wanted. So he's kind of uh, understanding where they're coming from and trying to uh, set up a teachable moment with them. On the next slide, just have a, uh, a picture of what we remember from last week. Jesus feeding the multitudes, and remember there were uh, 12 baskets of leftover bread and fish. It's quite a miracle, and that seems to be all that they have on their minds but Jesus has a little bit more on his mind in this teachable moment as he's going to talk to them about who he really is, which is the bread of life, the bread for the world. So he says, I am the bread that gives life. I am uh, the bread of life. And you may have heard this before. It's a pretty famous passage. It is uh, the first I am statement that comes along in the book of John. And it mirrors what he had said to the Samaritan woman two chapters before, um, I am living water. Okay, and she said, give me this living water. He said, if you have this water, you'll never be thirsty. In the same way, if you have this bread, if you have me as your bread, you'll never be hungry. So they hear bread, and they think manna. They think Old Testament. They think the Bible stories that they know. They think Exodus. They think Moses. And they think manna. And it just uh, reminds us how much the people of Jesus' time had these Bible stories just in their bones, in their blood. It was right on the tips of their tongue. People would memorize Bible stories. 
people could recite Bible stories, and it was just kind of in the culture. It was the water that they swam in, so that when people said something like bread or water, they would have been thinking, oh yeah, bread, kind of like in the book of Exodus where manna came from heaven. And so they asked Jesus, well, are you talking about like Moses and manna in the desert? Because that was a pretty good deal. For us, we have to kind of remind ourselves of the Moses manna story in the desert. So let's do that right now because it all, uh, you know, kind of coordinates together with what Jesus is talking about with bread. So if we look back in Exodus, uh, second book of the Bible, it's the story of the Jewish people, the Israelites coming out of Egypt. Remember, they were slaves under Pharaoh and they escaped, they passed through the Red Sea, and they were headed for the Promised Land. Should have taken them only a month or two to get to the Promised Land, it ended up taking them 40 years because they were wandering in the desert, and eventually they started getting hungry, and they cried out to Moses, they cried out to God, we're hungry, we're starving, it'd be better if we had stayed in Egypt, and God says, I will rain down bread from heaven, and the people will collect it every day. And so it became called manna. That's what the Israelites called this bread from heaven. Uh, According to the text, it was a a soft, flaky substance that would appear on the ground every morning, and they would go out and sort of pack it together, pile it together, put it in some baskets, and they could kind of lump it together and make a sort of bread. Um, It was white on the ground, um, and they would, like I said, you know, gather it up with their hands, and it would sustain them for that day. And so Moses commands them, Um, go out and gather enough just for one day. It'll be there every morning. People being people, they would often gather too much, and they would try to keep it for the next day. You can understand where they're coming from. You could call it hoarding, or you could just call it planning, but they would try to keep it in a jar or keep it in a basket next to their bed so that they would have more manna for the next day or the next day or the next day, and maybe they would want more manna than everybody else uh, around them. And God had a plan for this, because if they tried to keep it overnight, well, the next day it would be foul, it would have spoiled, there would be worms in it. And so this was kind of God's plan for making sure that they gathered it day by day and didn't try to save it up till the next day. And so the Israelites called the bread manna, it was like coriander seed and delicious as wafers made with honey. I mean, we don't know exactly what this would have looked like. But this is the the narrative that's handed down to us. And they would have to go out every day and gather it, otherwise it would spoil. I think on the next slide we have an artist's rendering of what it might have looked like. You know, we don't know exactly what it would have looked like, but these kind of piles of soft, white, bread-like substance that they would gather up. And they ate manna for 40 years before they went into Cana. There was a provision for the Sabbath day, because they weren't allowed to gather manna on Saturday, on the Sabbath day. So they were allowed to gather double the amount of manna on Friday, the day of preparation. So you can see God had this whole plan to make sure that they were fed, but also to make sure that they were daily depending on God and God's provision. You know, there are um, monks and nuns in the world who will carry around um, a bowl with them, and they will go out into the town And the bowl will be empty, and they know that there's no food for them back in the monastery or the convent, and they'll simply go up to people uh, around the town and give them a blessing, and then hope that the people are generous enough to give them food. And they'll put a little bit of rice in the bowl or a little bit of bread into the bowl, a little bit of vegetables, and that's their daily sustenance. And, you know, some people look at that and say, oh, well, these monks or these nuns, they're just trying to, you know, abuse their bodies so that their spirits grow stronger. But just as important, it's this notion of depending daily on the generosity of others, depending daily on on God for the provision that they need. And if you were to be in Asia, you would see monks going around with little bowls um, with, with rice in them, and that's their daily rice for the day. I think if Jesus were speaking in Asia, he wouldn't have said, I'm the bread of life. He would have said, I am the rice of life. Because it's not so much about the bread It's about the daily gathering of it. And Jesus is saying to them, look, I am the bread of life, I I am the bread of life, I am the rice of life, I am what you need every single day. So when the people, and this is my next slide, when the people say, you know, what about manna in the wilderness? What about the bread that God gave our ancestors in the desert? Jesus said, yeah, that's a perfect example. Manna, I'm the new manna. 
He says, I'm the bread of life. I am the new manna. That image that you have in your head of this Old Testament story of manna from heaven, that's me. I am what you need, and God has sent me, just like God sent the manna, to sustain you. So, they would hopefully start thinking about themselves, and we are hopefully start thinking about ourselves. How is it that Jesus has what we need? How is it that Jesus sustains us? How is it that Jesus feeds us? Maybe we are fed physically through being part of a community. Uh, there are certainly people in this community who show up here every Wednesday, for example, to be fed physically by the goodness of, uh, of this Christian community. Maybe you are fed and sustained by Jesus through prayer every day. Maybe you are fed and sustained by Jesus through forgiveness and the forgiveness that Jesus offered. And I was thinking to myself that sometimes forgiveness is a daily exercise of, uh, of people that we have to forgive or, or ourselves that we have to forgive. Maybe you are fed and sustained by Jesus through guidance. Maybe you're fed and sustained by Jesus through something as simple as the, the Jesus prayer. It's a prayer that's been around for over a thousand years. It goes like this, Lord Jesus Christ, Son of the living God, have mercy on me, a sinner. I know people that say that every day. I know people that say that every hour. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of the living God, have mercy on me, a sinner. This is the type of sustenance that can be offered to us by Jesus day by day by day. And so he says, I am the new manna, if it'll pop up on the next slide. This thing that you need every day, I'm it. I've got what you need. I was thinking to myself how Jesus might give this same concept to us. This was the best way he could explain it to his people living in first century Palestine because they had bread and manna on the brain. They understood the idea of living water because they lived in a desert region. How would Jesus get across the same point to us? And so I was brainstorming about what it is that's in our kind of um, the tip of our tongue or in our cultural conscience. And I thought to myself, advertising slogans and TV slogans I think Jesus, if he were to speak to us today, would be just as interested in advertising slogans and TV slogans because they are so much on the tip of our tongue. Let me show you what I mean. I'm going to put up an advertising slogan, and you tell me what the, uh, what the product is. Don't leave home without it, American Express. I think Jesus would say, yeah, don't leave home without it. Yeah, it's talking about me. He would say, I am the American Express of life. I am something that you need every single day. Don't leave home without me. And of course, these advertisers want us to think that we need this thing every single day. And Jesus would say, nah, I'm the real American Express. I'm really what you need to not leave home without. How about the next one? It's everywhere you want to be. Anybody? Visa. Yeah, you got it. I think Jesus would see that commercial and say, yeah, good. That's me. I'm the visa of life. I'm everywhere you want to be. What do we have next? Like a good neighbor. <laughs> Ooh, that is a good slogan. <laughs> state Farm. Jesus would say, yeah, that's me. I'm the State Farm of life. Like a good neighbor. These, these images, these kind of cultural messages that you have on the tip of your tongue, Jesus has a great way of sort of flipping them and saying, it's really talking about me. I've got two more. The best part of waking up. Folgers in your cup. There we go. I think Jesus would say, yeah, I'm the Folgers of life. I'm the coffee of life. The best part of waking up. And those of us who drink coffee know that it is something that you need every day. <laughs> Just like manna in the wilderness. And so, you know, here's Jesus speaking to his audience and saying, I'm the bread of life. I'm the manna of life. I am the living water of life. And maybe if he were speaking to us, he'd say, I'm the Amex of life, I'm the Visa of life, I'm the, I'm the State Farm of life, I'm the coffee of life. It's all the same point. It's all the same point. Jesus saying, I am what you need. And I think on the last slide, I've got Jesus saying, you need me every day. The Israelites had to go out every day and gather the manna that God had given them. They couldn't save it up. It couldn't be sort of a I'll gather seven times as much for one day and have it left over. No, it, was a, it was an everyday thing. It was coming to God and saying, I'm depending on you not one day a week, not two days a week, not three, 
not four. This is my LeBron James impression, by the way. Not five, not six, seven days a week for us to make sure that Jesus is not just a hobby or a passing interest, but to say, Jesus, you've got what I need every single day to sustain me, to feed me, to bring me through. And it really is the mark of a mature Christian faith, this, this mature Christian faith that I think we're all kind of on a journey toward. It doesn't matter how long you've been a Christian. It doesn't matter how long you've been going to church. It doesn't matter if you wear a collar or not. You know, we're all on this quest for a mature Christian faith. And I believe very strongly that one of the marks of a mature Christian faith is that we seek Jesus seven days a week. Whether it's prayer, whether it's scripture, it's, it's the reaching out to Jesus and saying, sustain me for today, um, every day. And so that's kind of our, our challenge for this week. Uh, if you can do it for one week, if you can pray and find scripture, or find Jesus, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, we're, we're on that road to this mature Christian faith, which will strengthen us and certainly strengthen those around us. Amen.